Good morning and welcome. It's great to see each of you today. If you would, please stand together and let's join in together and sing. What a great place to be in the house of God, right? No better place than heaven, right? Amen. Let's sing with you if you would. Stand up, stand up for Jesus, ye soldiers of the cross. Man, you just got to get excited, amen, just do. Listen, I want to thank you all for prayers and the thoughts. My mom is passing. Uh, I tell you, we prayed for a long time for mom. She had been going through some troubles, and we all prayed. The brothers and sisters all prayed together, actually, in unison for, if, if Lord, if you took her home, make it quick in 18 hours. And she really only suffered a few hours of those hours, and the rest of it she slept, and my brother was there when she passed, and she literally went to sleep. And woke up in heaven. Amen. Isn't that good? How good is that? You just can't beat that. It's just a great thing. So I thank you for all those prayers and thoughts. And, you know, I, when I say that being in the house of God, we think about this, that we're all, we're all one body. Amen. You're my brothers and sisters in Christ. And you and I, we're going to be in heaven for eternity together. Let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord God, today. Just remembering of all the great mercies you've shown, all the great things you have done for us as a church family, as your people. Now we pray, Father, that you would anoint this day, this time that we're together. Lord, help us to remember the reason we're here is to bring you glory, honor, and praise. Help us to, to do that this morning, but help us, Lord, also to remember to listen to what you have for us today. 
Bless the preaching of your word. Bless the music. And help us, Lord, to be mindful of all that you have for us. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Please be seated. Amen. Thank you, choir. Welcome everyone who's here today. We welcome our guests who are watching online as well. We have some special guests who are with us in service today. A couple rows back we have Brother Jerry and Sister Carol Pinkerton. They were Free Will Baptist missionaries over in Africa in the Ivory Coast for 36 years. Wow. And, Lord, and they are some of the choicest of God's servants here in Free Will Baptist. And we are honored to have them with us today. I was uh, growing up in Greeley and uh, our church there in Colorado, and I remember as a boy when they came to present their missions work, 
and uh, Brother Jerry had one of those snake skins from a snake they'd killed in Africa, and it, you know, it took up the whole row uh, there, essentially, and, and uh, just inspired to, to serve the Lord from their example, even from a, a child. So they have retired from their service, and we're glad that they are here in the valley in this area. And uh, we do have, uh, in your bulletin, have our connection card, so if you are with us as a first-time guest, we'd appreciate any kind of information you'd be willing to share. And if you're part of our church, if you want on the back, you can update, uh, have any info that's changed, or if you have any prayer requests that goes out in the weekly prayer message that we send out, just feel free to put that on there, drop that in the offering bag, or put it in the offering box on the table with the blue tablecloth. If you are a first-time guest with us today, on your way out, Brother Charlie and Sister Sharon Moore will be at the Welcome Center, and just make a note to them, and we have a special gift to give you as being our guest. And uh, our kids' choir is going to come up at this time. The kids have been learning about the book of Acts and about Paul and Peter and those that are telling others about Jesus. And so they're going to sing some songs about sharing the good news of Jesus with others.
All right, great job, kiddos. And the older kids are going to stay in big church today. So if you're six and older, stay in here. And five and under are going to head next door to kids class. We can go ahead and have our ushers come forward as well. Let us pray as we worship God with our tithes and our offerings. We thank you, God, that you are so good to us and you blessed us. We pray, God, that we might share from the abundance that you've given and give from the heart. Bless this offering to the work of the ministry in this area. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. 
What a great song. How great thou art. Good to see each of you here today. It's great to see the Pinkertons with us. Glad to have them here. It's good to see. I thought I saw Janie walk in. Did, did she walk in? There, oh, there's over in Children's Church. I saw them. Uh, Brother Al Young, I just saw him out in the parking lot this morning. He had an accident last week, and, and as a result, he lost a finger in the, in the accident. And, uh, but he's got a new Range Rover, so he, he, said, he said he'd take us all for a ride in it after service, so maybe not. But anyway, we're glad that you're here. It's great to see all of you, and we hope that the service today is a blessing to you, and I hope that we can do something that's encouraged your heart already, so glad that you're here. Uh, before we get into the scripture, and I want to encourage the boys and girls to follow along with me in your Bible. And if you've got an outline from your bulletin, please feel free to follow that out and fill that out if you want to. We want you to do that. But i got to tell you about a preacher. He wanted a dog. He and his wife wanted a dog, but he was real specific about the dog that he wanted. And so <clears throat> what, he, he went to the, the dog kennel and he said, look, i, I got to have a, just the right kind of dog. It's got to be a Baptist dog. And he went from one place to another, from one breeder to another, from one dog kennel to another. And finally, he put a, a, an ad on Facebook and said, I, I need to get a Baptist dog. And uh, an owner called and said, I just, I've got the exact dog that you need. And uh, he said, well, it's got to be a Baptist dog. And he said, well, come and see, and I'll, I'll show it to you. So he went over there and showed it to him and he said, um, well, it's a nice looking dog. It looked like a Labrador or something like that or a mix of some kind. And, and uh, he said, uh, but how, how do you know it's a Baptist dog? And so he said, uh, go get the Bible. And the dog went over to the shelf and picked a Bible up off of the shelf and brought it to the master and laid it at his feet. He said, now look up Psalm 23. So the dog opened the Bible with his nose and used his paw and Turned to Psalm 23, put his paw just right there. He said, man, that's great. And so they just thought it was a wonderful thing. And they 
they thought, well, this is the dog for us. And they, they bought the dog. And so the preacher one Sunday after service was over was showing the dog to some of the folks that had been at church and stayed around after church was over and, and said, um, well, show us your dog. And I said, what about him? And he said, go get the Bible. And sure enough, the dog went and got the Bible. And uh, he said, well, turn to uh, 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Amen. So anyway, he dog turned there to that. He said, well, does he do any regular kind of dog tricks? He said, well, I don't know. I've never tried. And so he said to the dog, heal. And the dog came up to him, put his paw right on the preacher's head, just like that. And the preacher said, oh, no, this dog is Pentecostal. I don't think that really happened, but I just thought I'd <laughs> share that with you. Take your Bibles, please, and turn to First, uh, First Samuel chapter 17. First Samuel chapter 17. All of us from time to time face some gigantic issues in life. Maybe it's uh, the fact that you lose someone you love, like uh, Brother Dale just lost his mom. Maybe it's the fact that you've had some life-altering disease or maybe you've had an accident or maybe someone else close to you has, lo has lost their lives or maybe you've had some financial reverses or some difficulties. But there are gigantic things in life that we face from time to time that are monumental problems. And everybody has that. And so the title of the message is Giant Killing 101. So this is an entry-level course on how to kill giants. So I want you to look with me beginning with verse 4 of 1 Samuel 17. Would you stand as we read 1 Samuel 17 and verse 4? And a champion went out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath whose height was six cubits and a span, and he had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was armed with a coat of mail. And the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze, and he had bronze armor on his legs and a bronze javelin between his shoulders. Now the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his iron spearhead weighed 600 shekels. That's about 16 pounds. And the shield bearer went before him. And he stood and he cried out to the armies of Israel and said, Why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege of being together. May you use this time to speak to our hearts. Lord, if there's someone here who's facing a giant in their lives, I pray that you'd help them today and encourage and give them strength. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. May you use this message to encourage each of us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Someone said that the Old Testament is the New Testament concealed and the New Testament is the Old Testament revealed. And I don't think there's a... There, and, and in other words, there are a lot of pictures in the Old Testament that show us what we're to see in the New Testament. And this passage for our consideration today is a passage like that, that we see some pictures of what is to come in the future. Now, I want you to notice four things in particular in this passage. First of all, uh, the massive malcontent. Now, do we have those pictures? Did that those slides get put in from, from today? Uh, notice this. This is Robert Wadlow and his dad. He holds the Guinness World Record for the tallest man 
ever to live. And if you'll go to the next slide, he is 8 feet 11 inches tall. The next guy that you see is a Sultan Kozin. He is now the Guinness World current record, record holder of the tallest man alive. He is 8 feet almost 3 inches tall. Now, that's pretty tall. That's uh, probably as tall as this ceiling above me. Now, but I want you to notice, Goliath was nine feet, nine inches tall. He's a big guy. Now, now he was a big guy, and he's probably three and a half feet taller than me. And he would be a big dude. But I'm not a grasshopper. I could bite his knees <laughs> or kick him in the shins. Even though he's a big giant, sometimes the bigger they are, the harder they fall. And so I want you to notice you find this description of him in verses 4 through 6. His head, his shoulders, his chest, and his legs were all covered in brass. He must have been a shiny looking dude. And I'm sure that he glittered and, and, and maybe glared in the Palestinian sun. Goliath must have been fascinating to look at as well as terrifying to the army of Israel. Notice if you would in verse 7 he says, His spearhead weighed 600 shekels. That's 16 pounds. Can you imagine? And it says the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam. It was, I mean, he was a giant hulk of a man. He probably had hands three times the size of mine. He could put your, his hand on your head and crush it like a grapefruit. I mean, he was a big guy. Notice also in verse 8, he stood and cried out to the armies of Israel, why have you come out to line up for battle? Am I not a Philistine and you the servants of Saul? You choose a man for yourselves and let him come to fight me. If he is able to kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail, then you will be my servants. Think about that. He was going to decide the fate of two nations in a hand-to-hand -hand combat between him and one Israelite. Now, the guy who should have fought him was Saul. He should have been, because the Bible says he stood head and shoulders above all the people. He was Israel's giants. Now, he, he wasn't nine feet, nine inches tall, but he was their giant. He was their big guy, and he should have been the one to do it, but everybody was afraid of this big dude. How many of you have a bully at school and you know about him? Anybody? Anybody? You know, if you're, hey, listen, could I tell you about one that used to beat up on me? His name was Wayne Phillips. They called him Sonny. He had no, he had, he was not Sonny. I'm telling you, he had no disposition that would think he, he was Sonny. But he would come up to me and uh, try to hit me. And I, I, one day he, I, got, I was on a horse. And I had a girl on the back of the horse with me. And I was leaning over the saddle horn just like this. And he walked up to the, my horse and said, get off the horse. I said, I ain't getting off the horse. And he goes, Poof, and punches me right in the mouth. And my nose and my lip bled. And all hopes for a romantic evening were gone. <laughs> he punched me in the mouth. Uh, one one night I w went to the football game, and I was on my motorcycle, and uh, I, I had left the football game a little early, so I had cranked up my motorcycle, and it was cold that night, and I was trying to get it warmed up, and Sonny comes, and he gets on the back of my motorcycle, and he starts punching me in the ribs. He said, let's go for a ride. Let's go for a ride. Let's go for a ride, and kept punching me. Now, boys and girls, moms and dads, there's nothing 
that you can do if you're trying to get your motorcycle warmed up and a guy is punching you in the ribs and he's on the back of your bike and so I and it had to be the Lord I just thought I got to get away from this guy he's going to beat the tar out of me so I hit the gas on my motorcycle like this and it went (laughs) just like that and then it went and so I popped the clutch and turned the wheel and did a wheelie or a, a donut and threw Wayne off in the mud. Praise God. <laughs> and I don't know why he hated me so much. Could have been that the girl on the horse was, he was kind of sweet on her. But anyway, that's another story. But there are people in life who are bullies. There are people in life who want to make life miserable for you. You know, the only thing sometimes we can do is just cry out to God and say, Lord, I need some help. And maybe that's all. Listen, some of us are facing other kinds of giants in our lives and we don't know what to do. But I want to show you what happened here. Saul told the men of Israel And he said, if you see this guy, he's coming up to fight. If one of you will go and fight him, notice in verse 25, that the man who kills him, the king will enrich with great riches and give him his daughter and give him his father's house exemption from taxes in Israel. Now, wouldn't that be fun? Wouldn't you like it if you got exempt from taxes in not just Israel, but how about Arizona? Amen. That'd be a great thing. But notice the guy. He was just a malcontent. Now, I want you to notice, secondly, the mighty man, David. Now, let me remind you that Goliath decided that the matter of two nations would be settled in hand-to-hand combat, him and another Israelite. And so, he says, give me a man. Now, I want you to notice We call David a mighty man, but really he was probably a teenager. And But I want you to notice something about him. First of all, he was sanctified by the Spirit. The Bible tells us that David had been anointed as king in 1 Samuel 16 and verse 13. Samuel took a horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of the Lord came on David from that day forward. And Samuel arose, and he went to Ramah. Now, we have some anointing oil, and the camera person, I'm going to move down here. And we keep this because the Bible tells us in James that those folks that are sick, we can anoint them with oil and pray for them. And the Bible says the prayer of faith shall save them. And there have been times when I've anointed people with oil, and they've gotten better. There have been times that we've prayed, and they've died. He said, what is it? It's the difference in the oil. We use three-in-one oil here. No, I'm just, I'm just, no, it, it's just, that's what God tells us to do. We want to be obedient to that, but not everybody is restored to health, maybe in this life, but they're restored to perfect health in heaven. Now, the, what they were doing, boys and girls, when, they, when Samuel anointed David as king, he took a horn, and it was a horn of oil, and he poured it on David's head and anointed him as king. But the Bible tells us that the Spirit of God entered David that day and was on him in the midst of his brothers. The Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So he had the Spirit of God, and he was set apart. He was sanctified by the Spirit of God. Secondly, I want you to notice he was sent by his father. In 1 Samuel 17, 17, we find that David was sent by his dad, Jesse, to go check on his brothers to find out how the battle was going. And in verse 17, he says, Jesse said to David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this dried grain and these ten loaves and run to your brothers at the camp. So he was 
following father's orders, his dad's orders, and he was going to check on his brothers to see how things were going in the battle. Notice the third thing about him. He was scorned by his brothers. Look at 1 Samuel 17, 28. Eliab, his oldest brother. How many of you have an older brother? Would you raise your hand? Got an older brother? Okay. How many of you have got a good older brother? All right. And how many of you, their older brother's lousy? Would you raise your hand? Oh, nobody? Okay. That's good. Well, Eliab, he was a good older brother in some ways, but notice what happened. He got mad at David. In verse 28, now Eliab, the oldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was aroused against David and said, Why did you come down here? And with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and your insolence of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. All you wanted to do was see the blood and guts of what was going on here. Have you ever noticed that when you drive by an accident, everybody kind of slows down and looks? Yeah. We're curious, aren't we? Oh, yeah. And he was thinking David was just coming, but David was following dad's orders, wasn't he? He was sent by his dad. Now, notice also David was strengthened by his past. Saul challenged David and his credentials, saying that he was just a youth. But you know... What here? Notice what he said in verse 33. Saul said, you're not able to go against this Philistine and fight him, for you are a youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. Could I tell you something? Just because you're young doesn't mean you can't be mighty for God. By the way, could I say this? Just because you're old doesn't mean you can't be mighty for God. God can use you no matter what your age. Now, David, he began to tell King Saul of what had happened in his life. He said, one day I was out taking care of the sheep and a bear came. And I killed that bear with my bare hands. I don't know about you, but that's quite an accomplishment to me. And he said, one day a lion came, and I killed the lion. And surely, God will deliver this Philistine into my hands today. The thing about it was, David killed the lion and the bear, protected the sheep, and God used him, even as a young man. I want you to notice something else about David. He was sustained by the word of God. I love how David responds to this Philistine giant. Notice these verses in verse 45. Then David said to the Philistine, You come with me with a sword and a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel whom you have defied. Verse 46, this day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the, uh, of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. What a promise. Think about it. He is telling King Saul and the rest of the Israeli army, he says that God is going to deliver this nine-foot, nine-inch guy into my hands today. Got to tell you something, whatever the giant is that you may be facing, God can deliver that giant into your hands, Amen. no matter what it is. And listen, David, and I won't go into the details of reading all the, the scripture about it, but you know what Saul figured David needed? David needed his armor. Now, Saul was a big guy, head and shoulders above all the people. He was Israel's giant. And so he gives this armor to David, and guess what? You can't wear somebody else's clothes. And by the way, this suit, it doesn't look like anything on the hanger. (laughs) 
It's the man that makes the clothes, right? <laughs> Here's the deal. Can you imagine David? And I don't know how tall David was. The Bible doesn't give us the details. I, I'm guessing he's not a tall guy. Or the Bible would have said that. Now, he's a handsome looking dude, a lot like me. And I'm teasing. But anyway, he was a, he was a good looking kid. He spent a lot of time. He, he was tan. He spent all his days outside taking care of sheep. But God had used him in a mighty way. And so he tries on the armor, and the armor doesn't fit. I mean, you, you can't wear somebody else's clothes. You've got to wear your own. And armor is made for you. It's not, you, you don't just go and just pick one off the rack. You know, one size fits all. So, he, can, he can't do that. But he has one weapon. He has a sling. And I don't know exactly what his sling looked like. But as best we can tell, it was a traditional shepherd's sling. It probably had a loop on one end and a little pouch in the middle and a and maybe a knot on the other end. And by the way, I did a little research about this. Probably, you could take the sling just like this and overhand it like a pitcher in the Major League Baseball team. He would come off the mound like that, and you could probably sling that thing at faster than 100 miles an hour. Now, I imagine, and we think of David doing this sling like this, right? What about this way? That, hey, you could sling it that way, couldn't you? I don't know exactly how he did it. But he went into battle with Goliath. With a sling and five rocks. You say, why did he take five rocks? Well, I heard that Goliath had four brothers. And maybe that's why he did it. But he used one rock. And the Bible says he slung that rock. It hit Goliath right there and killed him. Now... Miss Katie's brother-in-law had an accident at work this past couple of weeks. He got hit in the head with some, some lumber. Is that what they can figure out? He got hit in the head with some lumber. He's got a concussion. Just by, it Maybe made a knot on his head, but he got a concussion. Do you know that you can die from a concussion? And you know what they do? If you bump your head, if you're not wearing your helmet when you're riding your bike and you end up on your head, do you know what your, your parents are going to do? They're going to keep you awake. You want to go to sleep, but they're going to keep you awake to make sure you don't have a concussion. Goliath wasn't so fortunate. Can you imagine? Did you all ever see the video of Randy Johnson? That was pitching, and as he was throwing to home plate, a dove flew by, and that ball hit that dove, and feathers went everywhere. Randy Johnson would throw consistently at 95 miles an hour plus. He's an amazing pitcher, and that was a freak thing that happened. But the bird died. Now, if you think about it, and David slung a rock, and it hit Goliath in the head, and he went down, I want to tell you, the Bible says that he killed him. And if you'll check the passage, he went over to Goliath, and he killed him again. He took Goliath's own sword, and he cut his head off. Now, you say, but pastor, it's not a good thing to kill people, is it? No. 
The Bible says you don't commit murder. Listen, boys and girls, do you know that the Bible has allowed for self-defense that you can use lethal force if you're defending your life for someone else. God also allows for killing during times of war. We don't ever like it, but God has allowed for that. And if your brother or sister was in danger or your parents were in danger, you would have the right to use lethal force to stop a threat. We have people in this room today who are carrying firearms in case someone does what has happened at many churches lately, come in and start shooting. And we have people that are prepared to protect you in case of someone coming in and there's an active shooter. We want to try to keep you safe. We don't want anything to happen. We don't want anybody to die. But we're going to stop a threat. Now, now listen to me. Here's the issue with David and Goliath. The people of God, Israel, were God's people. They weren't always obedient. Just like you're not always obedient. Are you always, do you always obey mom and dad? Huh? They're looking at their parents or for their parents. <laughs> do you always obey? Boy, it's important to obey, isn't it? But do you always obey? You know, Israel didn't always obey. And you know what happens when they don't obey? How many of you have ever gotten a whipping? Would you raise your hand? How many of you need one now? We're going to line you up after service is over, and we'll just take care of that for you. But here, here's the thing. Because God had called his people Israel out of every other nation, because other nations worshipped false gods, and they were doing evil things. Now, Israel did evil things in its time too, and God judged them for it. But I want you to notice that God gave Goliath to David, and David won the battle. Notice he was successful in battle, and he won a great victory for God and God's people. But I want, also, I want you to also notice there's a third thing. We have multiple monsters from time to time. So what do you mean? We have giants in our lives. First of all, we may face the giant of fear. Have you all ever been afraid during a storm? Last night, the trailer shook a little bit in the wind. And Patsy looked at me and said, do we need to go outside? I said, what would we do if we got out there? I am not Jesus. I can't say, peace be still. You Sometimes you have to just ride out the storm, don't you? Thunder and lightning can sometimes be scary. Wind can be really scary. And could I tell you this? There are some other things that cause us fear from time to time. Sometimes, sometimes not a, it might not be the weather. It might be a test that we have at school. It might not be it, it might not be the test at school, it might be the bully at school. It it might not be the bully at school, it might be what happens in the big game. Or it might not be the big game at all. It might be something that you're just afraid and you're a little timid. Whatever the fear. Could I tell you that 381 times in 164 verses, the Bible says, fear not. The fear sometimes keeps us from doing what God wants us to do. There's the giant of fear. There's also the giant of finances. How many of you know this? 
Um, anybody besides me ever more, have more month left at the end of the money? <laughs> Absolutely. You know, things... <laughs> Have you all looked at your 401k or your 403b recently? Don't. Don't. You'll have a heart attack. I mean, uh, isn't it terrible? What, listen, who wants to spend $5 a gallon for fuel? Nobody does. Tough times can be tough. And listen, Maybe some of us need to think about that. Maybe it's time to get out of debt. Maybe it's time for you to take an FPU class, a Financial Peace University, whatever it might be. Maybe you need to take the tithe challenge and learn to start giving faithfully to God your 10%. Whatever it is, if there's a giant of fear or of finances, the Lord can help you to whip the giant. Notice also, there's the giant of family. It's amazing to me how many Christians let their unsafe family determine how they ought to live. You know, if your Aunt Susie is coming to visit and she's not a Christian, you can tell Aunt Susie, Aunt Susie, we're going to church and you're welcome to go with us. But if you don't go, we're going anyway. and You just get here the best you can. You just take care of yourself, but we're going to church. But, but Aunt Susie's old. So is your pastor. I got up and came today. There wasn't anything good on TV. So I showed up. Now, here, here's, the, here's the deal. Don't let your unsafe family keep you from doing what what you ought to do. You know, my family, when I was a kid, we used to go to, uh, uh, to Lake Hudson. There was just a few miles from, from where we lived. And we'd go down on Lake Hudson. We'd stay down there. And my dad would have a camper. And, and my uh, Aunt Geneva and Uncle Carl, they had a camper too. They had a, one of those Airstream trailers. You all know what I'm talking about, them silver bullet things. that they, That's what they had down there on the lake. And we'd go down there on a Friday afternoon. We'd go down there and we'd stay at the lake. And especially around 4th of July, you know what we'd do? Don't tell your mom and dad I told you this. But around 4th of July, we'd have bottle rocket fights. If you don't know what that is, it's probably a good thing, Okay. But we'd go down there, and man, we'd have fun. We'd play with our cousins. We'd swim in the lake. We'd go fishing. We'd shoot bottle rockets, Roman candles, and firecrackers. And it was all, it was fun. And we'd eat hot dogs and hamburgers and chips. And boy, it was just great. But you know what happened on Sunday morning? We'd get up, get ready in our tent or in our camper, and we'd go to church. And you know what happened with the rest of my family? Most of them stayed at home. I'll be honest with you. I told my mom and dad, I want to stay. It was more fun at the lake than it was in church with old Brother Henry. You know who Brother Henry was? He was my pastor, and he was old, and he had gray hair, and he could preach for an hour and 75 or 80 minutes without taking a breath, and he would preach a long time, and he used to spit when he preached, so the first three rows, they just usually got a shower, you know, and here, here's the thing, you know what, I thought, this guy, why, why am I even doing this? Until one day I started listening to him. I listened to what he said. And what he said from this book spoke to my heart. And I realized that I was a lost sinner. And I needed a Savior. And I... Ask Jesus to forgive me of my sin and to be my Savior. And he did. And some of you boys and girls 
And some of you moms and dads, if you don't know Jesus as your Savior and you're not sure if you died, you'd go to heaven. If you've got some giants in your life that you're facing, could I tell you, you need Jesus today. And I may be old and gray-headed and losing my hair and gimpy on my foot. But I'm telling you, the power of the Word of God can change your life and mine if we'll let it. It may be, listen, not just the giant of fear and finances or your family. Don't let your family keep you from serving God. It may be the giant of folly. Have you ever done anything stupid? Yeah. I've done some stupid things in my life. Bottle rocket fights were one of them. My, my, uh, my cousin Lynn, on one 4th of July, he was running across the street to the fireworks stand and got hit by a car. He was in a body cast from his waist, had his head kind of up like this, and had a body cast all around his face. And he was the target. <laughs> We'd shoot BBs at him. He had his little pock marks all over him. Don't, don't listen. That's a stupid thing to do. Don't do that. Okay? Say, so why are you telling our kids what? Because your kids do stupid things too. Hello? Uh, one fourth of July, I picked up a black cat. You all want to know what a black cat is? Not a cat, it's a firecracker. And it had a fuse about like that. I mean, quarter inch. I picked it up. You know what a punk is? Yes. It's Robert. That's what. That's uh, <laughs> a punk right there. No. You know what? You know what a punk is? It's that thing that you light. It, it, uh, some of you have incense burning at your house or something like that to take away the fish odor or whatever. We use those to light firecrackers. And it had a little short fuse. Now, you're not supposed to hold them in your hand. You're supposed to light them on the ground and then run away. But I picked one up and I held it in my hand just like this. And you know what happened? When the fuse is only like this, and you touch that punk to it, boom! It went off in my hand. It burned these three fingers, and I had to have eye, my hand in ice for the rest of the day. That's a stupid thing to do. You don't put firecrackers in. You, you don't use lighter fluid and use it for a flamethrower against the army men, the little plastic green. You don't do stuff like that. Can I get a witness over here? Some of you have done the same dumb things that, I have. Hey, we do dumb things from time to time. Every one of us make mistakes. And maybe, maybe, maybe yours is when you were a little older. Have anybody ever, have you ever invested in anything you didn't understand? Okay. And you lost the money, didn't you? Hey, it happens. We do some dumb things. Some of you buy lottery tickets. Uh, listen, you buy lottery tickets or you go to the casino and you put good money in there and thinking you're going to hit the jackpot. Guess who wins? Guess who wins? The casino wins. It's a stupid thing to gamble. Say, how do you know? Because I gambled. I was on an FFA trip in the back of the FFA director's pickup, and I learned to play blackjack. Won $14.67 on the way home, lost it all on the way back, and that cured me of gambling. <laughs> it is a stupid thing to do that. It's a stupid thing. But we do stupid things from time to time, don't we? Thinking we're going to hit it big. And usually what happens is the giant of folly kills us. Maybe it's faults. Everybody has faults. But don't let your faults define you. All of us have made mistakes. 
Don't let the giant of your mistakes determine who you are. Let the Lord Jesus Christ do that in your life. How about the giant of failure? Have you ever made a mistake and failed really bad? Some of us have. What about the giant of the future? Listen, I don't know about you. I don't know what's going to happen in the economy. I, uh, listen, it doesn't matter who's in the White House. We're in a mess. We're in a mess. And, in le- and listen, until we take the money out of it, whoever's elected in office is just going to get richer and richer. And unless we have something like term limits, you serve two terms and you just really... You know, I don't care, Republican or Democrat, they're all, they're all getting rich. And here's the thing. Maybe there's nothing that we can do about that, but we had a God in heaven that's going to take care of us. Amen. Don't care who's in the White House. Our, our, our future is not dependent upon how the election turns out. Our, and by the way, could I say this? Um, and I, by the way, there's, a, there's an article on the table, on the little white table, for you parents on the way out with this insane teaching of critical race theory and this nonsense about sexual preference and all that. Your kids are getting it. It is time to get your kids out of public school. Right. Amen. It is time. Amen. You say, well, I don't know what I'm going to do. Well, you need to teach them at home. Because they are not getting, and I I challenge you, get that article and find out what's going on in Arizona. Your kids are guinea pigs. And I'm, I'm, you say, well, pastor, what, what will we do? I tell you what, if I had kids today, I wouldn't put them in a public school for the life of me. Because you don't know what they're teaching. And if you read that article, you'll find out what's going on right here in Arizona. And you don't have control. They are with your, the teachers are with your children more than you are. So you're going to have to take that back. The responsibility of training your children is on you. Now, let me go on. The giant of the fix, and, and I meant addictions and habits and that kind of things. The giant of your frame. What, listen, when something goes wrong in our bodies, um, Dave Hansen is going to have to have surgery a uh, couple of weeks. No, it doesn't know for sure. Uh, Danny Learned is going to have to have surgery on his uh, spine and neck, and, and he's uh, on the 27th. Is that right, Danny? And and listen, when something goes wrong inside your body, could I tell you that Psalm 103:14 says, For he knows our frame and he remembers that we're dust. And we're going to be praying for both of these guys and for others that, that God will take care of them because he knows what we face. One more thing. We got, go to the next slide, would you? We got a massive malcontent, Goliath, the mighty man, David, multiple monsters that you and I face, but we've got the magnificent master, Jesus, who can take care of the giants. Regardless of what you face, you need the master to help you face them and eliminate them. Jesus accomplished on the cross victory over death, hell, and the grave. And I tell you, whatever we face... And as a nation, you know what believers need to do? We need to pray, we need to vote, and we need to stand for what's right. We need to do that. Why? Because Jesus said, I will never leave you or forsake you. Hebrews 13, 5. Why? Because Jesus said, greater is he that is in you than he who is in the world. I have overcome the world, he said. Why should we... Listen to God because 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. God is faithful and will not allow you to be tempted beyond that you are able, but will with the temptation make a way for you to escape that you may be able to bear it. He's promised that. 
2 Corinthians 10.3 For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God, to pulling down of strongholds and casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity and the obedience of Christ. Hey, listen. Whatever we face, whatever giant is in your life, the Lord will take care of it if you'll ask Him. Could we stand for prayer? I don't know what's going on with you. And it's not important that I know every detail. We're going to pray for you. But whatever's going on in your life, whether it's a problem with a giant or a problem of something else that you're facing... The Lord can help you. If God's speaking to your heart and you sense a need to come for prayer today, the altar's open for you and we got folks ready to show you from God's Word some answers of how you can defeat the giants in your lives. God's speaking to you while she plays softly. Would you come? And we'll pray with you. You can settle some things between you and God. If you're not sure about your relationship to the Lord, you can come today. How about you? God's speaking to you and you'd like to come for prayer? Come right on. Come right on. Anybody else? Let's pray. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, speak to hearts as only you can. We're going to trust you for the outcome. Thank you for the opportunity we have to meet together like this. We thank you for the privilege of being together. Lord, you know the needs of every heart, but especially these who've come, you know the giants they may be facing. We ask that you'd guide and direct them. I pray for parents of school-age children today, God, that you'd help them to make right decisions regarding their children's education. I pray, Lord, that you'd help our boys and girls with whatever problems or giants they face at school, God, help them to trust you. For we ask it in Jesus' name. And for his sake we pray. Amen. Just remain real quiet while these are praying. And we'll be dismissed in just a moment. I want to thank you for being here today. I want to thank our boys and girls for being a part of the service this morning. I'm glad that you're here. If there's anything that we can do to be of help to any of you, don't hesitate to call on us. Would you pray for uh, Brother David and Brother Patrick today? They're going to be holding the service at uh, Countryside today. And they're going to be offering the Lord's Supper to uh, the residents there who are believers and so I hope you'll pray about this. This is the first time our church has done that at the countryside, but I hope you'll remember them. It's good to see Mary and Sandy back with us today. We're so glad that they're doing good. and um, we, We've missed uh, some of you. We've got some out. Um, the Dyers are out today, most of them. Um, uh, Miss Phyllis is here, and but uh, they were got exposed to COVID, so... Uh, remember their family when you pray, and I hope they don't get sick. Uh, pray for Brother Al that everything heals up for him. And uh, he was facing 10 or so surgeries, the doctor said, and so he decided to have that finger 
go ahead and remove. So he, he's, he's shaking hands with his left hand today, okay? You better remember him when you pray. God bless you for being here. I hope the service is a blessing to you. Look forward to greeting you in just a little bit. Let's close with what we have coming up the next few weeks. We've got service this Wednesday, 10 a.m. and 7 p.m. as we continue in our Bible study. We have information packets. If you have accepted Christ but not taken that next step of baptism, that's the first thing to do as a believer. So if you need to be baptized or if you're interested in becoming an official member of the church, that's also an option. We can give you information packets there. The, uh, we do have a box out there for food bank collections and see Brother Powell and Sister Janet as uh, their family is participating in that. So if you have any kind of canned food or anything that's on the list of what's needed there, you can bring those. We do have the Bible reading plans on the table with the blue tablecloth. Right now, you're going through the New Testament. Just this year, it's in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians and Galatians, so that schedule is out. Uh, we also have the other through the entire Bible this year plans and re reading schedules as well. The funeral for Brother Dale's mom is going to be this Thursday at 1, uh, it says a.m. there. No, that's in, it's going to be p.m. Okay, 1, 1 p.m. in the afternoon. and. Uh, Burdale has family all over the world, some in Australia, some in Minnesota. So we're going to stream the funeral for the family who can't make it. And so if any of our sound and tech people are able to come to that, please see me after service today just so we can have a little bit of help with volunteers for participating in that. And uh, we do have Grandparent Sunday coming up the second Sunday in September. So if any grandparents want to send in a picture of them or them and the grandkids, I just send that to Sister Patsy's email there, and we'll put that in the slides for that Sunday. And do continue to pray for our church at 431. That's the address of the property here. And we just need to keep praying that the Lord will open the doors, exactly what he wants us to go through, and his timing would be fulfilled in everything. Bill. Okay, building committee powwow after service as well. So with that, let's stand and close in prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you for the word of God. We thank you for how you used David, even from a young age, how he was preparing to be used of you. As a young boy, he was practicing there watching the sheep and with his sling and practice defending them against the bear and the lion. And that from whatever age, Lord, that we can be developing skills that can be useful for you, that we can give our hearts to you and uh, be used in ways, whether in music or whatever it is, to be a blessing and be a part of your kingdom. We thank you that we face many battles against sin and things that are uh, seem to overwhelm us at many times, Lord, but that you can give the victory through everything. We ask you to give us wisdom through whatever it is we might face. God, our church with uh, the building and the finances and the next steps, Lord, be with those that have surgeries coming up and others. You give the healing touch. Be with us as we are separate ways. In Jesus' name, amen.